Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. We're going to carry on a little bit where we left off last week. Uh, we, do you remember the title? Uh-oh. I will walk with God. <laughs> I will walk with God. But today there's going to be a little subtitle on that is this, God cares. God cares. And when we talk about walking with God, I, I really had this for the last, but I feel like it's very needful that we cover this now so we don't run out of time. Because when we talk about walking with God, and it's very important that we word it that way, because I don't want to ask God to walk with me because if I'm in the lead, I might be going the wrong direction. I need to be going in the direction that God's going. So before we get into any scriptures, when we talk about walking with God, and as Pastor Susan has talked and uh, Dylan has talked about, um, and what well, we all have really through the whole year, about abiding and I've, I've been talking about walking with God. And, but what does that look like? You know, we, we can say, do this and do that. But it's really good to slow down long enough. I know it doesn't get you booked revivals. But um, it's really good to slow down and explain what does that even look like to walk with God. Well, first of all, this. I need to know God's Word. That's right. I'm, and I'm not talking about just, you, well, you need to know God's Word. Let's just put it that in a nutshell. I need to know God's Word because I can't do what I don't know. I can't do what I don't know. Uh, and these are, this is just, don't speed read the Bible. Hello? Don't speed read. If you're on a Bible program, reading program, read the Bible in a year, that's, that's all great and fine if you're retaining what you're reading. But if, it's ha if you're having a problem retaining, you need to slow down and try to understand exactly what you are reading. Uh, in a maybe this is even for youth. Ask your leaders questions. Don't be afraid to ask your leaders questions. Uh, I probably asked Pastor Susan more questions than she cares to answer. But I want to know. I don't want to stay ignorant. I want to be bold enough to say, I don't understand this, and it's okay. Because really, your heart with God, is the, mo your, the attitude of your heart is the most important thing. And I would rather just be open with the Lord and say, Lord, I don't understand this. And, and get it, rather than acting like I know and never really getting it. Ask your leaders questions. And this is our to be, go without saying, ask the Holy Spirit to show you. Did you know that Jesus said that when he's, he's talking to his disciples, but I believe he was also talking to us. He said, when I send the Holy Spirit, he will remind you of what I said. The Holy Spirit is a reminder. He will remind us and ask him to show you the truth. And he will show you the truth. Second thing and, and, and I'm, I'm, trying, I'm wanting to get into the meat of this, but I feel like it's very needful. So, uh, I don't want time to get away from us here. Pray. <laughs> pray. And when I say pray, I mean talk to the Lord like you would your friend or somebody that, that you really enjoy talking to. Talk to God. And, and I know we talk about developing a prayer language, and we talk about that as in a gift of the Spirit and praying in tongues. And yes, that is important. But understand this, we do come to God in a reverent manner. We certainly do that. But understand this also that I, I, when I read about Abraham, the Bible said he had this testimony that he was the friend of God. We need to become friends with God. We need to be that intimate with Him so that when we read His Word and when we pray and we talk with Him, it gets to a point to where... There are, believe it or not, there are a lot of people in the religious world that deem prayer as something that they have to do. When the reality is this, when you begin to develop a relationship with God, prayer is actually something you, 
you look forward to doing. And above that, you will see that prayer becomes a part of every part of your life. The Bible, uh, the Bible doesn't say it, but one of my friends said it. <laughs> that a praying man will be praying no matter what he's doing. Uh, a lot of people in here today can testify to this. Uh, I've been walking through the store and found myself talking to the Lord. Uh, I was talking to the Lord in the gym today, uh, and I didn't realize somebody was even in the restroom. I thought I was the only one there, and I was just having this blown-out conversation with the Lord. And they come around the corner, and I was... I just said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not crazy. I was having one of those mornings anyways because I was trying to find my belt and I had it on. <laughs> you ever had one of those? <laughs> Looking for your glasses and you just wear them. I literally, I, had, I was asking my wife, I, couldn't, I was tearing my closet up, couldn't find my belt, and I was wearing it. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't care. We, and you, I care about people, but understand this. If people catch me praying, I don't care. It's that important. That we were talking to the Lord. Um, and have a, this is the third one. Have a part of the day that you disconnect and you just have your mind on Him. I'm not talking about you're talking, reading. You're just a quiet. I don't care if it, and if people say, well, I don't have time. You got, I would dare say, well, <sighs> do you ever get those weekly reports on your phone? I'm, my, my, I, I'm guilty with my right hand in the air. I throw myself at the mercy of the court. I'm guilty. <laughs> if I've got time for that, I've got a moment to start honing a relationship with the Lord that says I've got time to meditate on Him. There have been moments where I have just stopped in the day and I just got quiet and you would not believe that the answers that will start coming to you immediately on the situations that you have in your life. So when I say talk or walk with God, I hope you are writing some of these things down because to me, I'm just, I can only explain to you what this is like to me and I've seen the success spiritually in my life and it's come from really just disconnecting from what a lot of people calls normal and just honing a relationship with the Lord and making Him a part of my everyday life. Because I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be mean and ugly at all, but there is a great part of the church world that this is the most of a, what they do on Sunday morning is the biggest thing they do with the Lord. And this is, I'm saying this, I put this on my life, is I had to understand that John Burge is not doing God any favors by coming to church. It's a privilege to be here. Yeah. And I always encourage people, go, just go into a building's not enough. It's what we receive when we get here. So I want to encourage you to, uh, I'm not, I don't want to shame anyone at all. I want to be very careful about that because I'm not here to shame people. But I want us to all understand that what we've been talking about all year long, this was an example of how you begin to hone that in and it becomes a part of who you are, not just what you do on Sunday. I want a bigger relationship with that, don't you? Um, you know, I, I guess with your, even with your spouses, if you saw them one time a week, I better be careful because some people must, <laughs> might call that a blessing. But I want to spend more than one day with my wife. I want, I want to have a bigger relationship than that. Amen. So I hope maybe that part helped you. But I want to start talking about this very quickly about God cares. This is what I want to talk about today. And in Psalms 46... And in verse 1, and a lot of people say, I'll know this, but this goes back to reading the Word of God. Um, and I appreciate so much just the pure emotion from these kids that were speaking, even if there was some tears shed. Cole, you bless my heart. He's an awesome, he's an awesome young man. He really is. I just, I just admire Stacy and, and Wes for the job that they're doing. Right, They are a great example to us, all of us parents, on how you are to raise kids. Amen. Amen. Psalms 46 and 1, David said, God is our refuge and strength, 
a very, and I want you to, I want you to underline this, a very present help in time, help in trouble. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Lord, I ask you very quickly, Lord, for the anointing, I know that we're already anointed. I ask you, Lord, that not just to speak, but for ears to hear. He hath ears to hear. Let him hear, God, what the Spirit says this morning. And this word change our life in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you in agreement with me on that? Well, God is our refuge and strength and a very present help in trouble. I begin to, and I've, I've said this a lot in my life about God being omnipresent. And it, it, does everyone understand what omnipresent means? Um, if you don't, it just means that it can be everywhere at the same time all the time, basically in, in Arkansas terms. But it goes back from when you hear things, but I, wanna, I want to find scripture on what I say I believe. Well, matter of fact, it would be good for all of us to go back and say, Father, I'm not saying that I want to denounce what I believe, but I, whenever I say I believe in something, if I don't know a chapter and a verse or where to find that at, I need to do my due diligence in finding that so I can know that the Bible supports what I'm saying I believe in. That's very important that the Bible backs up what we say we believe in. So, He's present in all places at all times. Here's, there's a hundred verses in the Bible that support God being omnipresent, but for the sake of time, I'm going to read off six here very quickly. Don't try to turn, just write them down. Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24, it says, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I feel heaven and earth, saith the Lord. Proverbs 15 and 3, it says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good, evil and the good. Psalms 139 and 7, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I free, flee from thy presence? Job 34 and 21 says, for, the eyes, for his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. Colossians 1 and 17, Paul said, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Hebrews 4 and 13, it says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Friends, I want to tell you today that God is omnipresent. He is everywhere and in everything. Uh, and I, I was thinking along this lines. If God is everywhere and in everything, it's going to solidify Proverbs 3 and 6. And we, is anybody familiar with Proverbs 3 and 6? Well, let's turn there then. Because we could read it off, but I want you, it's good to turn to these because it's good that when you see them and you, and you can underline that. And most of all, I can't remember it word for word. If I hold this out far enough, I don't have to put my glasses on. So, <clears throat> verse five, let's just read verse 5 here. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. I find that a relief, that I do not have to lean on my understanding. But in verse 6 it says this, In all thy ways, say all, all. thy ways. Amen. Let's say it this way, all my ways. my ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now, what does all mean? It didn't say in some ways acknowledge him, or the ones that you deem significant. We're going to get to that here in just a minute. But if God is everywhere and in everything, and that means everywhere and in everything... That means that He's in everything that I do, no matter how big or how small it may seem. And I need to acknowledge Him, and He will direct my path. There are times in my life, and maybe you have thought this as well, people will say, why do you pray 
uh, before you speak. I'm going to tell you why. Because I need the Lord's guidance, not just in preparing a sermon. More than ever, I need Him up here with me, especially right now in a, in a double manifest presence to help minister to you, not just so that we can say, well, we had a good message today in a good church service, but as we covered Wednesday night, the reason we gather these things together is because we do want to be obedient to the Lord, but we do this because we love people. Yes. The goal in what we're doing right now at this very moment is ministering the Word of God into your life because God loves you. Yes. And He wants you to have an answer. He wants you to have direction in everything that you're doing. So I should be acknowledging Him in everything that I do. The area, and I'm going to say I'm throwing myself in there. So when I say we, I mean me as well. I believe an area that we are guilty of is that we begin to uh, categorize what's important enough to bother God with. So when Solomon said, in all thy ways, as we just covered, that means all of my ways. Whether I think they're important enough, or if we make the grave mistake of wondering if somebody else thinks that my problem is big enough. You know, when Paul said that comparison's not wise, that's in all things. Actually, when we start judging problems too big or too small for God, we begin to humanize Him and therefore we begin to put limits on Him. It is a grave mistake to ever try to put God in the same department as a human. We are not going to humanize Him but we're going to set him up in a place where he is omnipresent and we understand that no matter where we are or what we're going through, that God knows and God cares. Psalm 78 and 41 says that God became very... I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. That God was very angry with Israel. It said this, that they turned their back and tempted God by putting limits on the Holy One of Israel. And I thought about that as I was reading that today. And I thought, I've, I've quoted as they limited the Holy One of Israel. But actually, whenever they limited God, they turned their back on Him of His holiness. To say, and, and, and if you read all through, so I didn't want to read all of Psalm 78 for, the, for, for time purposes. But you could see where God was reminding them of all the things that He had done for them. They walked through the Red Sea. Manna every morning. Quail by... They couldn't even eat it all. I think in one part of the Bible it said that the, they had... That God told them, You're, I'm going to give you so much quail, it's going to be coming out of your nostrils. And how He had kept them. And whenever... Uh, gave them water to drink. And had led them by fire, led them by a cloud. He was with them all the time. And God was very upset because even though they saw all these things, they began to put limits on God. And, and, and we can say the same things like, Oh Israel, what a, what a horrible people, you know, what a horrible thing to forget all the good things that God has done for them. But there have been times in my life that I come to a situation or I come to a problem and I've forgotten what God's done for me. I've forgotten in the past what God has done for me. In the book of Philippians chapter 4, <clears throat> in verse 6 it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with what? When we come to a thing in life that, that seems so big enough that even we don't feel like God can take care of it, it's time to stop and begin to take some inventory and look back over our life at what God has done for us. And I don't know about you, but sometimes we lay down, Bob, and we're like, oh, life is so bad. And like, well, I'm a little bit hot. I'm going to run over the thermostat. Oh, God, life is so horrible. At 68 degrees all the time. When it's a hundred and something degrees outside and we talk about how... But I slept in a bed last night. I slept... My, I had roof over my head. I got up and I had clothes to wear. I had food to eat. I had transportation. I had family. I've got my health. Friends, what problem is too big for God? 
or too small for God. In all my ways I should acknowledge Him. Some people would say that this is childish, but we can see so many times where, uh, actually in Mark chapter 10, we don't have to go there, but you can mark that. They weren't going to let uh, the children come to Jesus. And He got very, I think in Mark 10, it's to become very angry with them. He said, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Well, I thought this about children. Children ain't ashamed to ask God for anything. Children ain't ashamed to ask God parents for anything. I think I got a. Uh, I was thinking yesterday. I don't know why these thoughts come to my mind, but I remember my mom and dad, and they're here today. But I feel like I can still tell this. Um, they had promised us ice cream one Sunday, and Kenneth and Christine Hallmark had come over, and they were staying just a little bit too long. We thought, and um, <laughs> we had ice cream on the mind. And I remember when it, when we brought it up, they said, "Well, we need to leave." Well, when they left, there wasn't no ice cream involved, but there was a whipping involved. <laughs> for interrupting their conversation. I still remember that. But you know, we we as kids, we didn't care to interrupt that conversation to let them know what we needed or what we thought we needed or what we wanted. There's so many times we're like, well, you know what, God, I don't want to interrupt. There's a lot more important things that are going on. Let me tell you something. God is not limited. He is not limited. Let's don't humanize Him and think that, well, you know, that's not big enough to ask God about. That's not important enough to ask God about. When He said, in all, my, all thy ways, acknowledge me, and I will direct your path. Believing God is in the things that I deem insignificant really is going to sow a seed for, of uh, believing God for what I call the great things. I don't need to wait for super great things to start honing in on my faith in God. I need to say, if God cares enough about people crossing the Red Sea, I think He would care if I need my water bill paid. And I believe it's okay, because on the grand scheme of things, there are a lot more important things in life than paying the water bill. But I believe that no, and and they'll they'll say, well, there's starving kids over in different countries. And that's true that there is, but God's uh, arm is not too short that he can't reach. He's he's in all places in all the earth. And God is not an either or God. He's an also God. So we have to understand also, don't be scared to start honing in your faith, asking God for those things that seem to be so uh, insignificant to Him as if God can't take care of all of it. You know, it's like if we ask God for too much stuff that the lights in heaven are going to dim. If we, if we ask God for too much... Let me tell you, God has got unlimited power. He has unlimited resources. As we see things in the earth like water and air, these are renewable resources. Is just like God. No matter how much we ask for, it's like the... You ever been... I, I talked about this Wednesday. You go to the dam and it's flood season and the waters are just rushing over the dam and you don't think, gosh, I hope there's enough water for everybody. No, you don't. You're like, there's too much water. And that's like God. It's like people are afraid to ask God like He's running out of stuff. He's running out of things. And God's like, no, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. There is so much more to me. Don't be afraid to ask me for anything. Don't be afraid to reach out. And you say, well, it's just not, it doesn't seem like it's all that important. Well, let me tell you something. If it's important to you, it's important to God. The, The relating story that I have, I told a little bit, about it last week was about my daughter's dog, Posey. And let me, t- I, I'm not going to go all into that for the sake of time, but she fell sick. We were very worried. Well, we were worried. I know you're not supposed to worry, but I was worried and I had to repent over that. But in the grand scheme of things, a dog, and people would say there's a lot more important things in life than a dog. But you know what? It was important to us. But as a dad, I saw my daughter's tears, Larry, and dad kicked in. And, and I wanted to take care of everything. I wanted to make the phone calls. I wanted to talk to the doctor. I wanted to get the, I wanted to find out all those things because the care that I had for my daughter was so great. 
And God just began to relate that to me as like, if you care that much about that, because I understand there are a lot more important things in life than a dog, but it was important to my daughter, so therefore it became very important to me. So friends, if you got something in your life that you may have deemed insignificant, uh, God is saying, look, if you care about it, I care about it. The problem is people don't realize that the greatest need that you have is the one that's sitting right in front of you right now. Do you know that? The greatest need you have is the one that is sitting in front of you right now, whether it's a dog, which praise God, Posey got better. She's back to bite my ankles and just... You can't leave food out. You can't do anything. And I, but you know what? Even though it gets a little frustrating, I'm just, I just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you care enough about me, even the littlest and the smallest of things that, I, that a lot of people would deem insignificant. But the reason that we need to grab a hold of those things is because there are going to be times in life that you're going to be facing some huge things. And you're going to need to look back at what God has already done for you in your life. And you're, need, you're going to need to have those testimonies on the inside of you. A second one was this. My oven quit working. People say, big deal, go buy another one. I didn't want to. I didn't want to spend $1,200 on an oven. And I kept sweeping it under the rug. And one day Miss Mandy was wanting to bake a cake for her father. And the, I had been negligent in my duties and getting the oven. Well, I got in hot water, Dylan. <laughs> but you know something? I began to look and I began to search. And I thought to myself, there's a whole lot more things more important in the world than, a, than an oven. And I had, it wasn't that I didn't have the money. I just didn't want to spend it on that. I'd rather spend it on something else. But as I began to pray about it, just a short little prayer, Lord, help me find the problem. Nothing spectacular. No, I, there, I didn't fall out in the Spirit. Uh, nothing. But God directed me, and, and th this is where YouTube comes in good. Okay? The guy, and this, this is not uncommon, but I thought it was really, I, I, I began to praise the Lord over it. A guy that had the same exact oven I had, having the exact same problem I was having. He showed how to get to the part, how to take the part off. He even put the link on where to order the part from. Shipped to my house, put it in. I became a hero to my wife. A good time was had by all. But I began, listen, that seems so small because you think, well, there's people that are dying with cancer. There's people that have AIDS. There are people that are starving to death. I understand all that. But God can take care of them and my problem all at the same time. And I begin to praise the Lord over that. Thank you, Lord, for helping me do And I didn't go around thinking, wow, look at me. I'm Mr. Repairman. I begin to get humble before the Lord and say, Lord, I want to humble myself before you. And I want to thank you for helping me do this. It might have been insignificant to anybody else, but you know, if your wife's getting on to you, it becomes a big problem. That's the problem right in front of you. That's the biggest one. And if it's, in, if it's significant to us, this is what I want to relate to you. If it's significant to us, then it is significant to God. And we must not grade the validity of a need from what someone else thinks or what we think someone will think. Think about that. We spend a lot of our time thinking somebody else is thinking something when the reality is they're not even thinking. There's a lot of people spend a lot of money to look good at the stoplight because they think everybody is paying attention to them. And the reality is when you're gone, everybody forgets about who that. They don't, they don't care about that. But we don't have to... Uh, we don't need to think what other people are thinking to try to determine is this significant enough? If, God, if I care about it, God cares about it. If I'm to acknowledge Him in all my ways, it's not the ones that I deem significant or important enough. That's why we go to Matthew chapter 6 and we read about all these things uh, where Jesus, in, in verse 26, I'm reading now the New Living Translation, it says, look at the birds. 
They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you, aren't, and aren't you far more valuable to them than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for, for wildflowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, He will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and He will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. If God cares about a bird eating, your problem's not too small for God. To think about when you walk out of here, if you see... I mean, even roadkill feeds the buzzards. Um, God even cares enough to supply for birds. He cares enough to supply for flowers in the field. Are you not more important than they are? But the problem is, is we don't go back to that child life faith and we don't want to bother God. We don't want to bother God with that problem. When God's saying, if you would just ask me, I would, if you ask anything in my name, I would do it. God cares. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm looking through here to see what we need to cover. The key to walking in victory is abiding in Christ. And this is, this is, this is very important. Thank you, Lord. This is very important. A lot of people are ashamed to ask God or afraid to ask God because they don't feel like they're worthy enough to ask Him. Um, they feel worthy and they feel ashamed. And friends, I want to tell you, this is where the enemy of your soul likes to work. In making you feel unworthy or that you haven't done enough religious things to qualify for God to intervene in your situation. Uh, abiding, and even we're going to go, uh, I would go to this later, but I won't for sake of time. But this is even where sin can hang you up. The devil likes to, and a lot of people think that when a person sin, is sinning, in the middle of sinning, that the devil is doing his greatest work. But I, I'm, I've been thinking about that, and I believe this, that the greatest work that the enemy does is in the aftermath. Enticing you to... And he's the one enticing you. This will be so much fun. This is going to change your life. This is going to be so great. And then when you do it, mm, mm, mm. I thought you were a faith person. I thought you loved Jesus. You see, he, and then the shame kicks in. And when shame and regret kick in, you're not going to ask God because you feel unworthy. You feel unworthy. And friends, today I want to tell you that abiding in Christ will help you understand this, that my sin is none of the devil's business. None of his business. That's between me and my father. And he doesn't have anything to do with it. But I also have to understand this, that Abiding in Him doesn't give me the license to sin, but abiding in Him will help me understand that I am only made worthy by the blood of Jesus Christ. And the power in His name is on, on what I'm needing Him to do when I ask in His name is not dependent upon how good I am. Because if me receiving is off of how good I am, then why did Jesus need to come? Why did I need a Savior? Why did somebody need to die for me if I could just do good enough? But there is power in His name that, uh, that I'm not dependent on how good I am. It's about how good He is. Philippians 3 and 8, don't, and I'll just read this very quickly. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I'm, get this, that I may win Christ. 
What he was saying there was, if you read through, you can see where Paul, according to the law, he said, I kept all the law blameless. That means perfection. But it wasn't enough. And he said, I count all that of loss. He said that I can win Christ. So if we are trying to weigh out whether we've done enough good to ask God to intervene in our life, friend, you need to throw that mess to the side so that you can truly win Christ. So that you can really um, receive what it is that He has for you. And he said be, in verse 9, "...and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto, this, unto His death." So we understand also that our needs, no matter how big or small that they are, it's not according to my win and loss record. Or my good versus my bad. It's about how good He is. And it's about what He's done. And the reason we need to throw that off to the side is so that we can truly win Christ. I want to be righteous by His blood, not by my own righteousness. I don't want to stand before God and try to tell Him all the good things that I have done. I want Him to see the blood of His Son applied to my life. And friend, that's exactly what righteousness is. Yes. I just want to encourage you today with this word. And I know we've had a lot going on today. And that's totally fine. But understanding this, that we are going to have to understand that there is not anything. I believe this is for someone here today is there are times in our life that we feel like what we're asking for, we're bothering God. Like, there's, He's got bigger things to concern Himself with. And you need to know today that God is in everywhere and He's in all things. And not only can He touch somebody over here that's in the big, huge trial, He can reach down and help you fix an oven. He can help somebody with cancer while He's healing your dog. He's not limited by our thinking or what we deem as, as important or not important. Because if you care about it, He cares about it. The same way with your children. If they're hurting, you hurt. Can I get... Yeah. Yes. Amen. Dylan has said it so many times about Ayla. If I, if she, when she's sick, if I could just trade places with her. And if we're having that attitude... And we're just natural. Where is the heavenly Father? Yeah, come on. On these things, like, Lord, I just I, I need help in this area, because the, as we said, the greatest need you have is the one that's right in front of you right now. And if it's important to you, it's important to God. Amen. Let's stand. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.